The Convent School Early Experiences of a Young Flagellant by William Dugdale Chapter 1 The Early Life of Lucille Since, dear Rosie, you are so interested to hear my birching and whipping experiences, I will try to recollect them as well as possible, but hope you will consider my weak state of health and not press me to tell you too much at once. Perhaps you do not know that almost from my infancy it was arranged that I should marry the Earl of Allington, who was about twelve years my senior, being a family compact of a purely mercenary character, designed to consolidate some very doubtful title deeds, which now that our union has proved unfruitful, are likely to entail great expense and annoyance to our heirsat law. My father, you know, was the Honorable Mr. Wharton, and my mother died in giving birth to myself, so that I was brought up under a nurse, and afterwards, when about seven years old, a young lady was engaged as governess to instill my juvenile mind with the rudiments of learning, preparatory to being sent to a finishing school. This lady's name was Miss Birch, and although my papa had known her father, Dr. Birch, for some years, I now believe that the fascination of her name had great influence with him in making a selection from the numerous, and in many instances more eligible ladies, who applied for the situation. Miss Birch was a dark lady about thirty years of age when she entered our family. Very good-looking, rather large, pouting mouth, set off with lovely rows of most pearly white teeth, which, when she smiled or said much, showed to beautiful effect, in contrast, to her rather swarthy complexion dark brown eyes, and thick, bushy, black, arching eyebrows. Her figure was well-molded and plump, and being about five feet six, she had quite a commanding presence. I was nearly eight years old before I began to notice the significant looks which occasionally passed between Papa and Governess. But hints were so often thrown out about the necessity of our procuring a good birch rod for the naughty bottom of Lucille, that I was gradually awakened to the discovery of some most mysterious kind of understanding which must subsist between them. My infant brain was much puzzled and alarmed, as I already felt in imagination the tingling smart of the green twigs I so much dreaded. Miss Birch seemed more exacting and severe over my lessons, especially when Papa happened to be in the schoolroom. And now I will tell you my first experience of the rod. One day after failing both, in spelling and arithmetic, she rang the bell and ordered the servant to request Mr. Wharton's presence in the schoolroom for a few minutes. Papa entered with a very serious look, requesting Miss Birch to inform him of the cause of sending for him. Mr. Wharton, said my governess, you know we have had many serious conversations about the necessity for proper correction in case Miss Lucille should continue so inattentive to her studies. Today she has failed in everything, and I am certain that unless her energies are sharpened up by the stinging smart of the rod, she will go from bad to worse. I am so averse to wield the birch myself, and would much prefer that her papa should take in hand the serious whipping she ought to have. Papa, dot ta, Lucille, you hear what Miss Birch says. I noticed him cast most excited and amorous looks towards the governess as he spoke. She has been most forbearing with you, and interceded with me many times to save your bottom, and even now cannot bring herself to lift her own hand. To make you smart a little it must indeed be a serious fault, to induce her to ask me to use the rod. But spare the rod and spoil a child has always been a maxim with me lay her across your lap, Miss Birch, and pull up her clothes whilst I get the rod out of the table drawer. Miss Birch, with heaving bosom, and quite a deep blush upon her face, I feel as ashamed at bearing her naughty posteriors as if I was going to suffer the degradation and humiliation myself. But come, Lucille, dear, you must bear it, and I hope you will be a better and more diligent girl in future. Then catching me by the wrist, as I stood by her side covered with confusion, she tried to lay me across her knees, but I struggled and screamed, No! 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 I won't be whipped! Oh! Oh! Dear Papa, do forgive me this time. My face quite crimson and streaming with tears. Papa, having got out the rod, 
a fine switch of long, thin birch twigs, tied up with velvet and silk ribbons at the handle. Come! Come! Lucille! This resistance will only make it worse for you. As he seized and threw me on the governess lap, Miss Birch, securing my head well under her left arm, speedily pulled up dress and skirts, till my fat little bottom was exposed in a tight, fitting pair of drawers. My legs being left to kick about, although I was quite firmly secured, and to all intents quite helpless, and my toes could scarcely touch the ground. I could hear Papa whisking the birch about, and then he said, That will do famously, Miss Birch. Keep her head and shoulders well down. As you hold up her skirts, much as I pity my darling little Lucille, I must do my duty and make her smart for her idleness in school. My face was burning hot with the deep blushes of shame, and I struggled desperately to free my head from the vice-like pressure of Miss Burke's arm as I begged with piteous sobs to be let off for this once. Oh, dear Papa! Oh, pray don't beat me, Papa! Indeed, I must, though every blow will send a pang to my own heart, you naughty. Bad, inattentive girl, all this has come by your great idleness, and trusting too much to the kind heart of your governess. As he said this, three sharp stinging cuts whacked on my tight-fitting drawers in quick succession. The pain was intense. I kicked, writhed, and screamed for mercy. Mercy! Oh! 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 Danny! I will be good! Oh! Um! Papa! Oh, Miss Birch, do let me go! Papa! In quite an excited tone, for I could see nothing. So you mean to be good in future? Do you feel the Birch is doing you good already? Huh! Huh! My little Lucille, you must have a little more yet to make a perfect cure of your idleness. Whack, 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 four more cuts, each one more agonizing than the last, in spite of my sobbing and screaming. Now, Miss Birch, he continued, let her feel it on the bare flesh, open her drawers so we can see the effects of the cuts. This was at once done as I cried, ah, ah, no, no, oh, Papa, how cruel, Papa, don't. What a sight. The rod has made her bottom blush finely. It's best to make her feel sore a few days, or she will soon forget it and relapse into her old ways. The drawers were unbuttoned, and I could feel they were quite pulled down my thighs, exposing the entire surface of my smarting rump. But I had only a few moments for reflection before the blows fell. Again in rapid succession, cutting, tearing, and scratching the skin, whilst the boiling blood in my veins seemed to throb as if it must spurt through the pores at every burning touch of the rod. My head was pressed against the tumultuously heaving bosom of my governess, and notwithstanding the intensity of my suffering, I could plainly hear the beating of her heart, and knew that her thighs were tightly compressed together, whilst a strange tremor pervaded her entire frame. There, there, that will do, said Papa in a very excited tone. I've drawn the blood for her. Now, Miss Dunce, kneel and kiss the rod, and ask your kind governess to forgive you. I slipped down on my knees, and hiding my face in my hands in her lap, promised Miss Birch, if she would forgive me now, to be a better girl in future. That will do. I don't want to be too hard upon Lucille this time. We will leave her to think over her disgrace and shame. And let her beware of the birch again, said Papa, taking Miss Birch's hand, to lead her from the room. This has been a most agitating scene for your governess, who must repose in her private room for a while to recover herself. The schoolroom door, which opened directly into her private room, was closed upon me, and the key turned in the lock. But all my hurts and bruises were insufficient to distract my attention from the peculiarly warm and excited glances which passed from Papa towards my governess, whose face was suffused with blushes, and her eyes turned down, as if afraid to meet his ardent looks as they passed from the room. My curiosity was excited so much that I listened at the keyhole. 
Papa was evidently remaining in the governess room. I could hear a rustling of her dress, as if some little struggle was taking place, a sound of smothered kisses and soft expostulatory, it's such as, I dare not. Oh, no, 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 not now. Pray leave me. Oh, the, oh, then an, an almost perfect quiet, except for a slight rustling sound, and now and then, broken sighs with heavy breathing. At last all was quiet, and having now been left more than half an hour to myself, in the schoolroom, I ventured to tap at the door and beg Miss Birch to let me into her room, as I would never, never offend again. After a very slight delay, the door was unlocked, and my governess received me with expressions of great tenderness, kissed her poor Lucille, and hoped my poor bottom was not too sore. Her eyes were melting with what I should now call a soft voluptuous languor, and scintillated with extraordinary brilliancy, all of which set my young ideas in a flutter of wonderment as to the extraordinary cause of her prolonged emotion. Things went on pretty smoothly for some time, but I found it quite impossible to avoid coming under the rod every now and then, the chastisement getting more severe on every fresh occasion. Papa always had to handle the twigs, and when I began to get older, Miss Birch would tie me up and leave the room, as she pretended to be quite unable to bear the scene. Still, Papa would always go into her sanctum at the conclusion of my whipping, to talk the matter over with my governess. I will tell you of a fearful birching, the last I had before being sent to the convent school. It does not matter what the fault was, but it must have been something very serious. Papa and Miss Birch both helped to tie me up on a four-poster bed in my own room. I was stripped of everything but my skirts and drawers, which were all secured and arranged so as to expose my back parts in the best possible manner for whipping. My hands were tied to the bedpost high above my head, and making me kneel on the bed. One leg was secured at the knee to the same post, my other leg being left free to kick about. Miss Birch vanished, and Papa arming himself with a formidable rood, elegantly trimmed as usual, began by lecturing me on my fault. You impudent girl, I can scarcely believe it of you, Lucille. Now you are just upon twelve, but this is the last whipping you will get at my hands, and I promise you it shall be a sound one, and then I'll pack you off to the convent, with instructions to the sisters to be very strict in looking after you. Ah, oh. oh, Papa, I implored. Have mercy, don't be so severe. Indeed, I won't do it again. Hold your tongue, miss he said impatiently. You always cry before you are hurt, but you shall remember this whipping as long as you live giving me a slashing cut round my loins, then an another, and another, on each cheek of my buttocks. How do you like it, you bad girl? Will you turn over a new leaf when you leave home? Will you? Will your? Will you? Will you? Each question being accompanied by a terrific smarter, the blows seemed to cut like a red-hot knife and my boiling blood tingled from the tips of my fingers to the ends of my toes. I could feel great burning bursting wheels rising on my skin at every cut I screamed, and plunged till the bedpost creaked with the strain, and my wrists and knee were quite pained by the tight ligatures by which they were secured. Let this be a solemn warning to you, Miss Lucio, he continued, but I'm afraid all my efforts for your reformation are quite thrown away upon such a worthless baggage cutting away still more furiously, and as I turned my head to scream and implore for mercy, I could see how excited he was over the business with the business. Flushed face and sparkling eyes, he was a fine, handsome man of about forty-five, and gave me the idea of looking as if in the midst of a tremendous battle. Anything but a bloodless battle for me, my bottom was soon dripping with the ruby drops of my young blood, the sight of which seemed only to exasperate him still more. Ah! Gunno, none of eyes, and in she, you little wretch, scream away! He exclaimed, "It's a beautiful sight to see you writhing and plunging under every skating cut. May it do you good, and draw the imprudence out of your tail. Will you, will you, try and behave better, or shall I send you off to the convent at once, in their holiday time? There, there, there!" 
He finished with three tremendous cuts, without waiting for my reply, and sank back, gasping for breath, into an easy chair. It was quite a minute or two before my screams and moans of agony subsided. Then Miss Birch coming in, released my hands and leg, and ordering me to rest on the bed for a while, retired with my father locking the door behind them. The smarting sensation now turned to a delicious, voluptuous warmth as I lay under the bedclothes. My right hand was passed all over the glowing surface of my buttocks and seemed at last quite unwittingly to settle itself on my hairless little cunny. I turned on my belly with my hand still under me and wriggling myself about as I lay thinking over all the cuts I had received, gradually found a most pleasing sensation from the rubbing of my hand, and the two forefingers mechanically worked into the slit. Squeezing my legs together, I rubbed on to increase the pleasurable emotions which I felt driving me to strive and obtain. I knew not what. The frenzy now threw me into such a state of excitement that my fingers were plunged as far as possible at my virgin cunny, as I gasped, writhed, and tossed my bottom up and down. The crisis came at last, and my furious efforts were rewarded by a most heavenly emission. My soul seemed to flow from me at the moment, and left me in a delightful state of voluptuous lethargy, which lasted for some minutes. And when at length I regained my serenity, it was to find my fingers, cunny, and thighs all sticky from the thick spermy emission of my first maiden spen. There was also a slight stain of blood, for I had actually ravished myself in my furious excitement. I got up and sponged myself, then lay down to reflect on the curious and delicious emotions I had procured for myself, and determining to soon have a repetition of my secret's joys. Fell asleep to dream of being in the arms of a most lovely boy about my own age, who seemed to impart to my ravished senses another taste of what I had already felt. Awaking in a struggle to retain my lovebird, I found myself bedewed by another emission, but at last I slept with tranquility, and never shall I forget my first taste of joy that day. Chapter 2 The Convent School My father's extreme severity made me rather glad when, in about a week's time, Miss Birch began to make preparations for my departure to Belgium, and in less than three weeks I found myself installed as a pupil in the seminary of the Urshuline nuns at Brussels. The lady superior struck me from the very first, as being a frightfully severe woman the morning after my arrival. She sent for me to hear her, read my father's instructions, and remarked that he had given her carte blanche as to punishment, and that in their school discipline was strictly enforced. Remember, young lady, said she, in dismissing me from her presence, we never overlook a fault, and that my word is law here. My face flushed with indignation, and tears filled my eyes as I left the apartment, fully assured in my own mind that I must soon experience a taste of their discipline, nor had I long to wait. For two days after, having confidentially expressed my disgust to another pupil, with respect to the course fare set before us at meals, I soon found I had been talking to a telltale spy who carried everything to the superior. An elderly nun quietly told me she had been sent to conduct me to the private room of the lady superior. My time was come, and I followed my chaperone with trembling anxiety. Our superior was a stern-looking woman of about forty-five, with dark piercing eyes and Roman nose, thin compressed lips considerably adding to the severity of her expression. MDL. Lucille said the superior. I thought the caution I gave you on your arrival would at least have saved you from trouble for some time and spared me the pain of inflicting personal correction on you. So soon after your entry into our seminary, but I'm afraid your papa must have had serious cause for wishing me to be severe with you now. What have you been saying to your fellow pupil, the Emdel? Olive, did you remark that the food was not fit for a dog? much less schoolgirls. I looked down in confusion. Ah, I see, she continued. You cannot deny it well, Lucille. I hope soon to convince you that our bill of fare is both wholesome. And proper for the pupils, I shall give you one dozen cuts with the rod, 
and then let you off if you promise not to offend in the same way again. The nun who was called Serena now placed a long stool in the middle of the apartment and made me lie on it full length face downwards. Then I felt her cold, busy hands as they turned up my clothes and opened my drawers behind, till my bottom was left naked to the attack of the lady superior. Do you, M. Dill? Lucille, she asked sternly, consider that our fare of bread and porridge three times a day and meat or soup twice a week added for dinner is only fit for a dog. Ah, huh, huh, she went on, cutting me slowly and severely at every few words. This will give you a better appetite. How do you like birch sauce, Miss Dainty Mouth? I screamed with the pain and plunged about so that Sister Serena had to hold me down with all her weight upon my shoulders. Forgive me, oh, forgive me this time. I won't speak to Olive again. I gasped out as the heavy woman almost stopped my breath. But at last it was over, and after kissing the rod and making me look at the thaw, blood-stained wheels on my bottom, they sent me away with a caution how I spoke about that, or anything else I might see done in the convent. I longed to have my revenge on the deceitful Olive, but knew not where to turn for a confidant. They all perhaps would be equally treacherous. I stuck to my lessons and avoided punishment as much as possible, being assured that the longer I brooded on my revenge, the more complete it would be in the end. At the same time, I thoroughly studied every part of the building to which I was allowed access, in the hope I might some day find it very useful if I wanted to effect my escape. The nuns, I believe, slept in dormitories, where there were a dozen or more together, but every pupil had a very small room to herself. Mine was in a long corridor, and Olive's three or four doors from mine, there were neither locks or bolts to any door, as the lady superior and elder sisters were supposed to take frequent peeps. At us in our sleep, I had at last matured my plan, and having everything in readiness, one dark night, when there was not even a glimpse of moonlight, I patiently watched till some of the principals had paid the accustomed visit, and heard the cracked voice of an old nun say, Fast asleep, as I feigned to be in a deep slumber. Soon their footsteps died away in the corridor, and after waiting some time, till I felt sure every pupil must be again asleep, if the going round should have awakened them, I crept out of bed, and providing myself with some pins and a strong piece of cord, was soon at the bedside of the treacherous girl I wanted to serve out my first act was to quietly pass my cord around her, outside the small bed, so that I could suddenly draw it tight, and secure her a helpless victim in my power, then suddenly stuffing the bedclothes into her mouth before she could scream out, ordered her in a rough whisper to keep quiet, or I would kill her. It was too dark to see her terrified face. But she shuddered all over, and seemed as if her very blood was chilled. So cold did she seem to my touch. Taking advantage of her fright, hands and feet were instantly tied, so that she was spread out in a helpless fashion, I made her own handkerchief, which I happened to get hold of, into a gag, and at the same time could feel the drops of cold sweat upon her temples. Now I turned up the bedclothes or pushed them off, as I was tying the cord, till she was quite naked from the bosom downwards. My hands roved over the soft, firm, naked flesh of her belly, then to the mount of love, which I found just beginning to be fledged with silky down. My fingers sought the crack below, and I could not help amusing myself by frigging her with all my might, the two first fingers of my right, hand ruthlessly pushing into her cunny, and I knew caused her intense pain from the slight groans which the gag could not entirely suppress. What pleasure it was to me to torture her by my roughness, and outrage her every sense of modesty, although I was too ignorant at the time to know that my fingers were actually taking the poor girl's virginity. A kind of fury possessed me, and I actually bit the lips of her cunning, and munched off as much of the silky down as I could. By the way, the pain must have been intense, and her writhing, shuddering agony was so much bliss to me. At last, to finish her off, I got a piece of the cord, and passing it right along her crack, tied it round her thighs, and waist as tightly and painfully as possible, and then for ornament stuck a lot of pins in the plum cheeks of her bottom, and left them there. 
my revenge was complete. So wiping my fingers on the bedclothes for fear of any bloodstains, see, I left my victim just as she was, to be tormented by her horrible pains and fears, till someone might find it out and release her in the morning. This outrage was never discovered. My victim was found insensible next morning, and remained in a delirious state for three or four weeks before. She recovered consciousness, and then the agony and terror she had endured on that awful night had so turned her brain that she believed it was was. The devil who had so grossly eluded her. But I heard that one of the father confessors was strongly suspected of having committed the atrocity. The superior, with whom Olive had been a favorite, now vented her spite in every direction amongst the young lady pupils of the seminary, and I, for one, soon fell under her displeasure, and was ordered to be tied up to their whipping post. It was only for slightly oversleeping myself, and not dressing quickly, when the bell rang for us to get up at six a.m. I was suspended by my wrists being tied high up the post, as I stood upon a small footstool. Then it was suddenly kicked away. The jerk of the sudden strain on my wrists almost making the straps cut into the flesh. My feet were dangling some inches from the ground. Oh, oh, ah! I screamed, how cruel! Oh, Papa, Papa! If you only knew how they are treating me in this awful place, Lady Superior, who seemed delighted at the sight of my pain, hold your foolish noise, Emma, Lucia. Wait till you have something to scream about, girl. Then the old Serena, who it seemed was always in attendance at punishment time, pinned up my skirts and opened my drawers behind, and the superior went on, "This rod shall make all the sluggards turn out quicker in the morning. What do you think, Mademoiselle, of making us all wake prayers for ten minutes? Will you wake, wake, wake up sharper in future?" She gave me three smarting cuts at each word. And my suspended position added so much to the intensity of my pain that I screamed, kicked, and plunged about as I swung by my wrists from the post. Sister Serena, exclaimed the superior, keep the girl steady, or I cannot plant my cuts as effectually as I ought to do upon her naughty, impudent bottom. She shan't sleep for a week if I can only make it sore enough. Serena now held me to the post with one hand to prevent my swaying about. Whilst the rod rained a succession of withering, scorching cuts on my buttocks, and just underneath the parting of the cheeks of my bottom, my screams were heartrending. But they only seemed to enjoy it more, and the superior never ended her objurgations till the rod was worn out. Things now went on till I was nearly fourteen. We never had a holiday, and only short letters came to me from home, in which my father constantly expressed his hopes of my improvement. And seemed quite oblivious to all I had written from time to time about my severe treatment, and begging him to remove me to some other school. I afterwards found out that my home letters were regularly suppressed, and others more suitable were written and sent to Papa, in my name. What wretch that superior now appears in my eyes! She not only delighted in whipping us nearly to death, but forget letters to our parents so as to keep her pupils. And make everything appear, color de rose. Perhaps, dear Rosa, you have heard that I managed to escape from that dreadful convent. But previous to that, they nearly killed me. I was getting quite a big girl. My p already sported its silken down on the mons veneris, which we all consider such an ornament to our secret charms. The superior had lately taken much notice of me and introduced me to a clique of her favorites. Three or four pretty girls about my own age, who were often indulged with little treats in her private room there. We girls were encouraged and instructed in all kinds of lascivious ideas. We looked at each other's cunnies, tickled and kissed each other in every possible way. The superior encouraging us and suggesting a variety of attitudes for us to try. She had a huge godemiche, about nine inches long and very thick, which she would fit upon one of the girls. And then submit herself to be as hard as possible, whilst the other girls had to turn up the girls' skirts and smack her bottom hard and fast with the palms of their hands to make the young gentleman, as the superior called her partner, work fast and vigorously. Then she would have us all stripped naked, 
whilst we had in turn to kiss and suck her c when it was all slimy with her spendings. I did not mind the slapping, or allowing anyone to kiss and tongue my cunny, but the superiors was so hairy, and had such meaty-looking lips, and a huge clitoris, which I now know is induced by long-continued self-abuse, and it smelt so fishy that I absolutely declined the honor of gamahooching her, and nothing could induce me to do so. This so enraged her that she flew at me like a tigress. I was knocked down and beaten with a thick stick till my flesh was bruised all over, and then picked up, almost fainting, and hurried off to my own little room. Perhaps nothing further would have happened. But in my innocence, I supposed my letters were sent home just as I sealed them up. So I wrote to Miss Birch a full account of what I had been seduced into, and the dreadful beating I had received, for not liking the cut of the Lady Superior. The very next day after I thought the letter was gone, the old nun, Serena, fetched me into a dull, gloomy room, which I had never been in before, but at once rightly judged to be a punishment chamber. When I saw a high whipping post, made of a square beam, set upright in the floor, with two rings near the top on each side, by which to tie up the victim a birch rod was hanging on the wall, and two scourges with long things lay upon a seat at one end, but I had no time for further observation, as the superior seemed to follow us into the room almost immediately. Now, M.D.L., Lucille, she exclaimed, grinding her teeth in rage, you shall rue the insult you put upon me the other day, before my special favorites, of which I had minded to make you one, so that when you left the seminary you might look back with pleasure to the loving amusements I had first introduced you to perhaps I should have overlooked it all. But see, I have your letter. Huh. Huh. You little fool to think that would ever go out of the convent. Sister Serena had by this time put me on a stool, and was fastening my wrists one on each side of the post. And presently the stool was removed, and I found myself just touching the floor with the tips of my toes. What a beautiful position! How she will twist about and scream when she feels the scourge, make haste to bear her bottom, as I am burning to pay her out. Ah! Ah! M.D.L. Lucille, I fancy you wouldn't mind kissing my canal if I promised to let you off, said the superior spitefully. My courage and natural obstinacy came to my assistance at the moment. I was so indignant, and the idea was so repulsive to me, that I resolved rather to die than do that for her. I was frightened and yet flushed with shame and indignation at my treatment. Besides, something seemed to advise me to irritate my tormentor to do her worst, and get it over quickly. No. No. No, never. You may kill me, and then I should be out of my misery, I exclaimed. She scowled with ferocity, but said with all the calmness she could command, Make haste, Serena, up with her clothes, and open the drawers well, and keep her as steady as possible. Then taking up the instrument of punishment that could see it, consisted of five or six long thongs of whipcord, plated and knotted at the ends, fixed on a very elastic handle. It was poised in her hand for a moment, and then brought down with stinging force on my exposed buttocks. Then again, and again, and again, in quick succession each cut seemed to sear, the flesh as if done by a red-hot iron. My piercing screams filled the whole place, and the superior, her eyes sparkling with ferocious joy, jeered me about how I liked the scourge. How lovely you look, Amdiel. Lucille, as you plunge and scream. And I know the intense agony of every cut would you rather die now, my little dear. Well, I've a good mind to kill you. Outright. Only I want to keep you as long as that dear kind papa of yours is willing to pay. How he must have loved his Lucille. To place her with me am so kind. So very kind, you know, my dear girl. What do you think of my kindness, you little love? Her cuts were awful, and I swayed and plunged, so that it was impossible for Serena to keep my body steady. So she seized the other scourge, and tried her best to second the superior in her efforts to cut me up more and more. At last they fairly panted for breath, as I was left dangling, sobbing, and moaning, with my clothes torn, 
my drawers in shreds, and streaming with blood all down my thighs and lay. Fearing I might faint, they poured a little strong cordial down my parched throat, sponged my face with cold water, and put some strong snuff up my nose, which almost drove me into convulsions. So very violent was the fit of sneezing produced. They seemed carried away with delight at the sight of my sufferings, and sprinkled a quantity of the snuff over the cuts on my bottom, just to dry up the blood, as they said with a laugh. Next, all my clothes were cut or torn off, till I had nothing on but slippers, stockings, and the remains of my drawers. Now, well, finish off the obstinate, impudent little beast. I wish I dare kill her, said the superior, grinding her teeth. Only I should lose too much. She is worth more alive than dead. A couple of ladies riding whips were now produced, and the two women attacked me afresh I was cut all over my body. Each cut seemed as if done with a red-hot knife. The blood flowed down my back in streams, and yet their rage seemed to increase at the sight of my sufferings. My screams were awful, but only so much music to their ears. They jeered and derided my cries for God, to have mercy on me. See, said my time was come to die. But they would make me last as long as possible, and draw out my agony to the very last gasp. This must all have passed in a very short time, but was an age of intense suffering to me, and the finale was such a display of ferocity that I sank under it, and thus robbed them of the pleasure of prolonging my torture. The superior seized me by the hair, and drawing my head back, lashed her whip across my face and bosom, drawing more blood at every cut, whilst old Serena, not to be outdone, took my right leg under her arm cut me dreadfully inside my thighs, along the crack of my pussy, and made the tip of her whip reach the Mons Veneris. This was the last I could recollect. But when I came to myself, I was in my own bed, wrapped up in cloths soaked in water. No bones were broken, and my health soon recovered sufficiently to enable me to effect my escape and avoid their further malice. Chapter 3 Lucille marriage and adventures. It was about 3 a.m., one fine morning, when I escaped from the Urshuline convent and made my way to the Hotel d'Angleterre. The porter, in answer to my summons, was about to refuse to give me refuge, when a young Englishman who was just taking his candle in the hall said, Head be damned if I should not be taken care of, and ordered the chambermaid to be called to attend on me, and added that he would be responsible for all expenses. Certainly, my lord, said the porter of the hotel. But he added, sotto voce, I think he's a fool to be so easily imposed upon. I was too glad to have found a protector, especially when I found he was an aristocrat. So I quietly followed the GFM de Chambre, and was content to await a while for the denouement of my adventure. Breakfast was brought to me about eleven o'clock, and also a message to say that Lord Dunwich, would do himself the pleasure of waiting upon me in an hour's time. You may be sure I was all impatience to see the kind fellow who had stood my friend, and was most agreeably surprised to find his manners quite equal to his appearance when I saw him again. His lordship was greatly interested by the account of my escape from the convent, and said he was a very particular friend of my betrothed husband, the Earl of Ellington, and would put me under the protection of a lady going to England, who would see me safe home. He was such a handsome fellow, and my gratitude was so gushing that at the moment I could have refused him no thing, and was delighted by the way he lingered over a kiss. He would insist upon as his due. My whole soul seemed to leap towards the generous fellow, and tears of disappointment stood in my eyes when he was gone. I never saw him again till my wedding day, two years later, when he was best man to my husband and in my eyes looked a thousand times more lovable. A married couple of sixteen and twenty-eight ought to have been blessed with every happiness. But after the first three days of our honeymoon, the Earl's temper seemed so overbearing and imperious that I began seriously to regret my fate and looked forward to a life of gilded misery. The Earl was fond of the turf and often left me alone whilst he spent a fortnight at Newmarket or Doncaster and York. One day I was agreeably surprised by a call from Lord Dunwich. We were living in Grosvenor Square at the time, 
he looked more handsome than ever, and seemed so full of sympathy for me in every respect that I could not help falling into tears and telling him all my fears, and how I was neglected for nasty, ugly, four-legged brutes of racehorses, and that, in fact, I was sure Lord Ellington loved his derby favorite better than myself, and would rather I broke my neck than his pet should fall lame. Ah, Lucio, he said, falling on his knees before me. How your distress cuts me to the quick. Would to God I could comfort you in any way. I have loved you from the first moment we met, although I knew you belonged to a bosom friend. And now the wretch slights you look up, dear Lucio. From your tears, smile upon one who is devoted to you, body and soul. And then seizing my hand, upon which he imprinted a lot of impassioned kisses. Ah, you will pardon my presumptuous love. How can I help it? I was piqued by the Earl's coldness towards me, and something impelled me to pity the handsome suitor at my feet, so that although the tears were still welling from my eyes, could not help smiling and caressing his head as he looked up to my face. Darling Lucille, I may call you so now. You respond to my love. My happiness is too great, he exclaimed, drawing my unresisting body down, so that our lips quickly met in a rapturous kiss of real love. I was lost, and he so rapidly took advantage of everything, that proceeding from one liberty to another, in less than ten minutes I was an adulteress. But what a sweet sin! What transports of love shot through our souls as we melted away again and again in the ecstasies of mutual. Enjoyment how we toyed with each other's most secret charms, and promised to renew our forbidden pleasure at every convenient opportunity. Alas for our happiness, some spy informed the Earl of my sweet liaison. He made an excuse to visit Brussels with me, and again I found myself incarcerated in a hateful convent. The kindness of my husband on our journey from England, which I afterwards found was only a part of his most artful program, had so imposed upon my rather soft-hearted nature that I really felt sorry that I ever been unfaithful to my marriage vows, although no doubt the image of my loving paramour was firmly imprinted in my heart. We went to operas, thou masks, saw all the sights, and enjoyed ourselves immensely for a few days, and being strict Catholics, he one day said jestingly, I suppose, Lucille, we must go to confession and get absolution after having enjoyed ourselves, and confess all the delightful sins we have committed by the. Be sure you do not forget to confess having ridden a St. George on your husband, and allowed him to spend his seed in your hand, or on your pretty bosom. They are most awful sins, and will cost a pretty penny for absolution. I should not be surprised if the Reverend Father undertook to inflict personal chastisement. A la la Girard. Ec cadier, he added, laughing. But, seriously, I answered, apart from joking, I know we ought to do it, and we'll go to that church in the rue. De la Madeleine these very day. I know I'm a sinner, but don't like to make a laugh of such serious things. Then, seating myself on his knee, I drew his face to mine, and kissed him lovingly, as I added, but, dear Francis, you won't leave your little wife so long again, will you, for those horrid horses? You can't imagine how dull and low-spirited I get when left all by myself. What a pretty, pouting little bride you look. Why, Lucille, the way you kiss excites me as if we were still on the honeymoon trip, but dearest, he added. A sporting man must see his horses tried and run. Then you know I shall make up in the winter what you lose in the summer. There's nothing else to do, then, but to make love. Ah, you sweet little devil. Do you want to commit another sin before confession? My hand had been gently caressing his prick outside his breeches, till it was now rampant and impatient of the restraining cloth. Well, he went on, following my example, by passing a hand up my clothes, and gently tickling my with his forefinger. Well, lump it all together, so there won't be any more to pay. My stars, Lucille, how excitable you are. You're spending on my fingers. It's nothing to blush about, little simpleton. I got off his lap and kneeling before him, unbuttoned his flap, 
and the engine of love seemed to leap into my hand. Its fiery head, with the skin turned back, looked so tempting that I could not resist the temptation to kiss and caress it for a few moments. My tongue played lasciviously round the tender and excitable surface, whilst my hands were fondling his finely developed balls. Darling! Darling! He ejaculated. It's coming. Oh! Oh! I can't stop kiss kisake. Take it in your mouth, Lucio. Oh! Ah! How delicious! You darling! To think you would give me so much pleasure! I was as excited as himself, and sucked and swallowed his delicious spendings to the very last drop, as he pressed my head down with his hands and gasped out his hands and gasped out his age of ecstasy. Now, it's my turn, sir. I mean to have a St. George, as you lie on the hearthrug. Come, down with you at once, or I will bite it off, making him feel my teeth as I playfully took it again in my mouth. We had a delightful bout on the hearthrug and I rode him till he spent into my excited c a third time, keeping his c stiff and starting him again after each spend by the contractions of the folds of my vagina, which he declared gave him the most exquisite and voluptuous sensations, and that he had never experienced anything to equal it in his life, many women as he had had in his time. Presently I told him that as soon as I could get dressed I would go to confession. Do love, he replied. And if the confessor is reasonable with you, I will go myself tomorrow, or send for him to wait on me at the hotel. I left him smoking a cigar, and about an hour and a half afterwards entered the church, where I was immediately accosted by an elderly priest. If the English lady wishes to confess, the Father Francisco in yonder box is most suitable for Madame. He knows the English way so well, and was consecrated in England. I approached the box, which was in a very secluded corner of a sacred building, and kneeling on a hassock inquired in a low voice, if the Reverend Father Francisco was ready to hear my confession. Yes, my daughter, and I pray God you may have nothing but venial sins to confess, was the reply of my unseen confessor. In my innocence I related every act of our married life, how excited we were in our love games, and the various attitudes we used to heighten our enjoyment. Awfully sensual, my daughter. Your confessor previous to marriage must have admonished you as to the use of these unnatural postures in following the dictates of nature and your endeavors to obey the first commandment. T.O. Increase and multiply. The holy rites of matrimony ought not to be perverted by lascivious ideas and filthy sacrifices to lust. It is a most serious thing, my daughter. But before I consider what penance to exact for such sins, tell me, as you value the intercession of our Holy Mother, have you always been faithful to your husband? If only by a look or a gesture, it is important to your salvation hereafter that you should confess it now. I was silent, dumbfoundered for a moment or two. Ah, my daughter, conceal nothing. Alas, it is as I feared conceal nothing from me or it would be impossible for me to grant you absolution. Thus, pressed, and feeling but a full confession would avail me with the confessor, I told him everything, and especially how sorry I felt at having allowed my peak at the thief. Earl's neglect to have carried me into such a liaison, and that the tender regard he had lately exhibited towards me smote me to the quick for my unfaithfulness, and that that was the reason I had so given way to lasciviousness with him, in order to compensate by the perfect abandon of my love, for any suspicions he might entertain. My daughter, I must consult our superior. Yours is such a serious case, and I beg that you will go into the vestry, by the door behind this box, and wait a few minutes till I bring you his decision, said Father Francisco. I was all of a tremble. My face felt hot with blushes of shame, and I longed to hide from observation for a few minutes, so I readily went into the vestry, as he had requested. It was a bare, scantily furnished room, with a few chairs, a writing table covered with papers, and some priests' frocks and vestments hanging round the walls. Presently, the old priest who had accosted me on my first entering the church came to conduct me to Father Francisco's room. But instead of that, I found myself in the cell of a convent, 
with the door locked behind me. The worst fears assailed my frightened mind. I sank on my knees, calling on God and my husband to release me. Crying and stamping in impotent rage, by turns this must have lasted an hour or two. Then a little wicket was opened in the door, and the same old priest told me to calm myself, for Father Francisco and the superior were praying to the Holy Mother to direct them what penance to impose upon such a sinner, and that I must remain where I was till next day. When, he added, no doubt you will be restored to your loving husband, as pure in mind and spirit as when you first took your marriage vows. I was going to implore him to allay the Earl's anxiety on my behalf, but he assured me they had sent to his lordship to say that I was doing penance for some hours in their convent, and quickly closed the guichet so that I was again left alone. Chapter 4 D. The Penance. Two nuns supplied me with refreshment, made me up a bed on the floor, and I really had nothing to complain of as to treatment that first night. Still, something seemed to assure me that I really was a prisoner, and should not so easily get out of the convent. My hope was that the Earl would speedily insist upon my speedy release, little dreaming at the moment that he was the instigator of my detention and had actually acted as confessor in the assumed name of Father Francisco. My anxiety was greatly increased the next day, when hour after hour passed, and still no communication from the confessor or superior. The nuns who brought me in breakfast and dinner were silent to all my inquiries or offers of bribes if they would help me get out of the place. My watch had stopped for one of a key, but about seven o'clock in the evening, as near as I could guess, the old priest opened the door and beckoned me to follow him. My heart suddenly recovered its courage, and I braced up my nerves to bear the severest penance we passed along several passages, and at last opening a door, he motioned me to enter. There, sitting before a small table, which had a Bible and crucifix upon it, sat a rather young priest, about the same age as my husband, but with a close-shaven face, and crowned the earl had heavy whiskers and mustache. I had never seen him otherwise, and he struck me as being very like Francis about the nose and eyes. Still, no suspicion that it could really be him came into my mind. Daughter Lucille, Lady Ellington, said the seated confessor, as the other locked the door behind me, in answer to prayer, the Holy Mother has inspired us to grant you absolution, only after the most severe personal chastisement and humiliations we can possibly inflict upon you. Then you will return to your confiding loving husband, purified of your adulterous sins. But for all that, he will still, and for the rest of his life, wear the horns of a cuckolded husband, which is his punishment for teaching you such lascivious ideas. It is an awful sin to so abandon yourselves to lust, and your unfaithfulness is the providential punishment he so well deserves. My face and neck were suffused with the blushes of burning shame, as my eyes fell beneath his ardent gaze. Besides, something instinctively told me that both Father Francisco and his coadjutor were enjoying the sight of my confusion. Now please divest yourself of everything you have on, except corset, chemise, and drawers, whilst I prepare this scourger for the guy. Chastisement of your wicked, sensual flesh, and my brother here will get that rope in order, ready to tie up your hands above your head. I scarcely knew how I got my dress and skirts off, as my hands trembled so, and the idea of stripping before two men, even if they were priests, was so distressing to my sense of modesty. But somehow or other, I was soon standing up, with my skirts on the floor, about my heels, and my last under-petticoat tucked up under my corset. Father Francisco confronted me, scourge in hand, and pointing with his finger to my drawers in front, roughly ordered me to open them, and show where I had admitted my lover, when in the act of committing adultery. Open it, you wicked woman. I must see the seed of lust itself. He flourished his scourge so, and gave me two such terrible cuts around my buttocks, that I was compelled to obey his immodest and shameful order, and the moment I had done so, he produced a pair of scissors and denuded me of nearly all the dark, silky chevelure I took such delight in viewing in the glass, 
whenever I dressed myself or just got out of my morning bath. I suppose you were so excited and wanton when Lord Dunwich embraced you that you showed him everything. Even your nakedness, as the Bible calls it, did you blush then, as you pretend to do now, Lucio? He asked. My surprise and indignation almost choked me so that I was unable to speak, and he gave me a heavy slap with his hands on my bottom, saying, So you will not answer, and think I am behaving shamefully, do you? It's nothing to what you will have to submit to presently. Lady Ellington, turn round and open your legs and stoop forward this instant, or I will flog the very life out of you. His rude hand was passed under my bottom, between my legs, and as I covered my face with my hands, I could feel his fingers invade every secret spot in turn even to forcing a digit up the fundamental orifice, which is always so tight and difficult of entrance, saying, as he did so, Did you let him go there? Or has your husband ever sodomized your bumhole? Ha! 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 And then, how modest we are now. Speak, say, if you ever allowed anyone to put his prick in your arse. I cannot recollect all he said or questioned me about, but his words and actions were every moment more and more coarse and obscene on purpose to add to my humiliation. Here, Father Anthony, he continued, addressing the old priest, where is your godemish? That's the thing to draw all the wantonness out of her lustful body. It is well furnished with good stiff bristles, Father Anthony. It's a new one. Same as we always keep in stock to subdue the fleshly lusts of these lascivious female sinners. And never used before, but I must tie her up. The rope, which hung from a pulley in the ceiling, was tied tightly round my wrists. Bringing both hands together, then he pulled it as hard as possible, till I could barely touch the floor with my feet. And all my weight was upon my arms and the muscles of my back. That's it, exactly, chuckled Francisco. Now, my dear Lucille, Lady Ellington, I ought to say, you will really enjoy the insertion of this jolly dildo up your cunt, and it is full of a delightful injection with which it will spend in response to your mission of pleasure. Uh, <laughs> no! No. Oh, pray don't treat me with such brutality, I screamed. In horror, when I saw the huge red-headed thing with its shaft springing from a bed of bristles, fixed round the balls so as to prick the cut at every insertion. Besides, its length and thickness seemed quite terrible to contemplate. I am quite content to submit to your penance of scourging and whipping, but oh, oh, have mercy, and put that thing out of my sight. Father Francisco, look, you need not be so frightened. I shall lubricate it well with perfumed oil to make it enter you easily. Besides, I will put some on your and bottom. Suiting his actions to his word, and oiling my privates profusely, especially my bottom hole, which he lubricated till he could easily work two fingers in at once. It was dreadfully disgusting, but still his frigging my bottom was rather exciting, and he could tell or guess my feelings. As he went on to say, I see you like it, but the dildo will make you plunge and spend with delight. He then took up my legs, one under each arm, and stood between them. So they were wide apart, and Father Anthony, his face plainly showing how he delighted in the task, proceeded to force his go de miche into me, opening the lips of my cup with his fingers till the head was fairly in, then ruthlessly shove, shove, till, ah! Ah, oh, Mars. I screamed in dreadful pain as the sharp bristles ran into the tender surroundings of my pussy. Ah, ah, and, oh my God. I screamed, plunging and writhing in my agony. His eyes glared into mine with a fiendish delight, only equaled by the look of his companion, who held my legs like a vice and encouraged him to f*** the wanton woman till she had had enough to keep her out of adultery for a long time to come. Presently, Father Francisco, digging his nails into the flesh of my legs, said excitedly, See, she's coming. The gluey spend is glistening on your dildo. Now, now, shoot it into her, let her enjoy it. 
In a moment I felt the hot gush of the contents of the Gudemish. It rather relieved me for a moment or two. But oh, oh my dear, even after this long lapse of time, I can never forget the agony of that moment. The whole of my body seemed filled with liquid fire, for they had filled the dildo with some infernal decoction on purpose to ruin my health and destroy all chance of my ever enjoying the sweets of love again. Such I know was their intent, for they taunted me with it at the time. But although I never quite recovered from the shock to my system, and feel even now that it was the original cause of my premature decay, they did not succeed in depriving me of all sensual desire or feelings for the future. I fainted. But they never let me down, and when at last I began to recover consciousness, Father Francisco was using his scourge most unmercifully on my buttocks, the drawers being open, and the naked flesh exposed to every cut. I thought this would bring her round, exclaimed he. See, Father Anthony, her eyes are opening. It will soon make her forget the dildo fu She did enjoy that. Did she not, Anthony? But shall be a long time before she has such pleasure again. Huh? Ha! Ha! And how lovely she's getting. See her wriggle from the pain of every cut. Ah, Lucille. Dear Lady Ellington, what intense delight the sight of your agony is to us. By this time either he was tired, or he thought a little respite would enable me to bear more presently. So dropping the scourge on the floor, he left me still suspended, whilst himself and assistant sat down and gloated over the sight of my suspended figure and blood-stained bottom. With their hands under their frocks, and I verily believe now they were frigging themselves. After about ten minutes, Father Francisco again approached, scourge in hand, whilst the elder priest gave me a few drops of cordial and held some pungent salts under my nose to refresh me a little. That will do, said the former. Stand back, Father Anthony. Now, now, you wicked, wanton, lustful young woman. Did you wish your husband dead when having connection with Lord Dunwich? Why don't you answer? Were his parts more pleasing to your sensuality? Is he better furnished than your husband? Speak up, confess all your wickedness. Did no sense of shame shock you in the midst of your enjoyment with that fellow, eh? Every question brought a scathing cut with it, breaking the wheels and drawing fresh blood at every stroke. But I really was so ashamed, I knew not how to answer, and my tongue was useless, except for moans or cries of pain. And notwithstanding all their degrading and cruel treatment, I felt it was fully deserved by me. Won't you speak? Won't you confess your sorrow for your sin? He continued. Are you really so lost to all sense of shame as to be hardened against repentance? This must be whipped, yes, whipped out of you, even if it nearly cost your life. Just then, Father Anthony loosed the rope a little, so that I could shrink further from the blows of the scourge till I was driven up to the wall, where I stood on tiptoe with awe, my hands drawn up over my head, and my back bending as much as possible to avoid the terrible shower of blows with which he was cutting up my buttocks still more and more, crimson with shame, tears flowing in torrents from my starting eyes. I moaned, cried, and implored for mercy, protesting in a broken voice that ever since my husband had renewed his kindness to me, I had been very, very sad and ashamed of myself for what I had done and only his former neglect had caused me to throw myself into the arms of a handsome man to whom I was under great obligations for protecting me when I escaped from the Ursuline convent. Ha! Huh. Then you are that Lucille who insulted Lady Superior. I heard all about it at the time. He went on furiously. Now you shall be punished for that too, seizing my left leg and lifting it up, so that he could cut freely under my thighs. On my sore cunny, and every tenderest spot he could think of, whilst old Father Anthony was rubbing his hands in delight at the sight. My agony was so intense that I could only gasp and sigh. Strength I had none. He seemed beside himself with rage, but at last dropped his scourge, and throwing open his frock in front, 
I could feel his rampant pago thrusting towards my mount, and am sure he spent on my drawers outside before he could get into me. This he soon effected, and taking my buttocks up in his strong embrace, he f furiously, swaying me about with my arms still tied up by the rope. But I forgot all that. His motions within me took away all feeling of pain, and I believe much as I loathed him and felt humiliated by all his dreadful treatment, that I actually spent copiously when I felt his hot sperm shooting into and soothing my overheated cunt. He was so overcome that Father Anthony, seeing he was about to fall, released me or loosened the rope so that we sank down together on the floor and laid almost motionless for a few minutes till the old priest, taking up a scourge, began to whip us both unmercifully and made Francisco get up. This was the end for that time, but I was ordered to prepare for a final penance in a day or two's time. Chapter 5 Chen The Last Sen and Denawomo They kept me in the same chamber, where I had been so outraged, the two nuns nursing, bathing my bruises, and using soothing injections to allay the inflammations of my privates. Till, on the third day, they said I was so far recovered that my confessors might finish the prescribed penance adding, with a malicious smile. We saw everything last time, and so we shall now, through our peepholes how delicious the sight was last time. And we had such frigging and dildo f after it was all over. Having said this, they speedily disappeared, and I was left to await my fate in trembling anxiety. I was hot and cold by turns, as the recollection of all. The humiliating and painful incidents of the other day came back so vividly to my mind, and in imagination I seemed to suffer all my tortures over again. This did not last long, although you may be sure it seemed long enough to me in my state of apprehension. A key was turned in the lock, and the door creaked on its hinges. My persecuting confessors again stood before me in reality, with quite a sardonic expression of anticipated pleasure. On their faces no trace of pity could I find on either visage. Nothing but gloating sensuality seemed to animate the ardent looks with which they regarded me for some moments. The hateful Francisco was the first to address me, a smile of terrible meaning playing round his mouth, showing his pearly white teeth to such perfection that I was again strongly reminded of my husband. Lady Ellington, I hope has had good time for reflection upon the heinousness of her sins, particularly those in contravention of her marriage vows. Wantonness is as nothing compared to that. What has the penitent Lucille to say? Has her chastisement made her feel the pangs of real remorse? He said, whisking a scourge before my face. I was too frightened to speak face, neck, and bosom. I could feel, or in a burning heat. Whilst my eyes could not meet his, for something more than shame instinctively told me what I might have to suffer at his hands. No sign of repentance here, Father Anthony. She must be stripped naked at once. Do you hear, Lucille? Chirp, strip at once, or it will be much the worse for you, he said with rough ferocity. Both priests helped me to undress, and in their impetuous haste almost tore the clothes off my back, at the same time taking all sorts of disgusting liberties, and keeping me in a continued state of confusion. At last, when nothing was left but my chemise to remove, they suddenly tied the rope round my left ankle, and in an instant I found myself suspended head downwards, with the right leg kicking in the air, and screaming piteously for mercy. Secure her wrists to the rings in the floor, said Francisco, and then help me to whip the seat of lust till she is a little more repentant. The elder priest speedily effected this and then both of them with scourges commenced to whip me most mercilessly, aiming their relentless cuts between my legs so as to cut the lips of my c and round my bottom hole at every blow. Now and then, the cruel thongs would wind round the upper part of my thighs or onto my mount. My cries were heartrending, as each blow seemed to reopen all my old cuts and bruises. Ow! Are! Ow! Ow! Will you never have pity, and believe me sorry for my faults? I screamed, or moaned, and gasped out the words in intense agony. So you begin to repent a little under the lash, do you, Lucille? 
Are you really sorry for having wronged Lord Ellington? Is it your mind, or your cunt, that is most filled with remorse? How you seem to writhe, and how prettily we are making it look for you. The trickling blood is delightful to see as it flows in drops and rills over your back and belly. His questions were spoken slowly as he seemed to enjoy the pleasure of my intense suffering, and two or three of his cuts were over the tender surface of my belly, or right across the navel. Scream away, you sensual woman. Why don't you implore the Holy Virgin to have pity and forgive you? We are only carrying out her commands. Are we not, Father Francisco? Hissed out old Anthony, as he continued to scourge my back and sides, and every now and then aimed a fearful blow right down my lacerated cunny. Again they would stop for a little, and ask me jeeringly, about my feeling of remorse. Would I indulge in such obscenity with my husband again, or keep from adultery in future? I was almost too far gone to do more than moan, and Father Anthony suggested that I ought to be well lashed over my neck, shoulders, and bosom to make me speak out. But the other, seeing how exhausted I really was, restrained his mad fury. And then, after waiting a little, one of them would give me a terrible cut and ask the other to see the beautiful effects of it as I swayed about in agony. This was done again and again, till after a time the scourges were thrown aside, and the rope being lowered, I was allowed to lay on the floor for a little while, and some cordial was again administered to refresh me, my tormentors sitting down and frigging themselves openly before my face, till in the act of spending, they would stand over me so that I might be thoroughly humiliated by having all their spendings drop on my face, neck, or head, as I was still secured to the floor by my wrists. Presently, at a sign from Francisco, his companion hoisted me up by the ankle again, and did it so tightly that I was frightfully stretched. By my arms and leg, which were drawn as painfully tight as he could make it, the fastenings cutting into the flesh so that I bear the marks to this very day. I could see that Francisco was again preparing his gotamish with oil, but he did not put any upon my person. Horrified at the sight, I begged and implored them in the most piteous manner not to degrade me again with that disgusting instrument, promising to pay the church any amount for absolution rather than endure it again. Too late, too late. Your repentance is not sincere. Besides, the other day, we saw with our eyes how your lascivious nature responded to the thrusts. Of this thing in your cunt, now I am going to degrade your bottom hole by inserting it there, however painful the operation may prove. Saying which he seized and held my left leg under his arm, and standing close to my body, at once proceeded to carry out his infernal idea of ravishing my anus. Lacerated. Bleeding and sore as my bottom was at the least touch. And regardless of my piercing shrieks, he forced the oily head of the India rubber thing quite into my tightly contracted bumhole. The pain was intense, as it seemed to rend the lining tissue of the anal canal in its passage, and the bristles round its root added, if possible, still more to the intensity of my suffering. I believe that giving one long shriek of agony, I lost consciousness for a time, but only to awake and find them laughing and jeering at my sufferings. As the one worked his dildo in my bottom, whilst the other had thrust two or three fingers up my blood-stained and wounded cunt, it is quite indescribable what I felt at this outrage, the accumulation of shame, agony, and horror so overpowered my exhausted nature that I went off again into such a death-like swoon that they really feared I was dead, and made haste to let me down as well as apply strong restoratives. My hands were still retained in the reams on the floor, and the goedemish was left sticking in my bottom, the spasmodic contractions, of the sphincter muscle holding it as in a vice, whilst the pulsations of the violated passage behind were still awfully painful. All this was apparent to me as I slowly came to myself once more and could see the excited looks of my cruel confessors, who proceeded to sprinkle me with cold water, and use a large sponge for the purpose of both refreshing me, and allowing them to gloat over the extent of my hurt. This lasted a little while. Then I was made to get up on my hands and knees, facing Francisco, 
who then opened his frock, so as to show me the excited state of his prick. At the same time, with a malicious look of fiendish joy, he asked me, If I should not like to suck such a delightful sweetmeat? Then seeing my look of intense disgust, he burst into a rage, saying, Oh, so you mean to insult me, as you did the Lady Superior of the Ursulines, do you, Lucio? You may think I am disgusting and nasty, or I smell strong as she did, and I may tell you, to make you relish it still more, that scarcely an hour ago it was up the strong smelling of that very same lady, and I was careful not to wash, so that you might have the full benefit of the delicious aroma of her spendings. Speechless, with disgust, and helpless in every way, it was useless for me to appeal for mercy or consideration. From two such heartless beings, the only thing I could do was to close my eyes to the awful sight. But only for a moment, a tremendous whack from Father Anthony, who had taken up the scourge, made me shriek out again. Ah! Ah! D ah! Will you never finish me off, and kill me in mercy? The only answer I had was a quick repetition of the blow, whilst the repulsive Francisco's right hand, clutching my hair, pulled my head up and drew it back so painfully that I gasped for breath. This was exactly what he wanted, and in a moment his prick was forced into my mouth. The sensation was so repulsive, horrible, and choking all at once that I had not the presence of mind to bite, or he would have repented the act ever after. Old Anthony was cutting my back, bottom, thighs, and loins, even the calves of my legs not escaping his frenzied scourging. Blood was streaming over my flesh and dripping to the floor in little pools, and I felt I was really dying at last. Just then the excited Francisco shot a deluge of hot sperm into my mouth, and throat I was choked, and remember no more, except that on recovering consciousness, the supposed confessor, Francisco, was dressed as a gentleman, and I immediately recognized him as my husband, as at the same instant, he exclaimed, Woman, my revenge is complete. You want to deceive me again? How I have reveled in degrading, humiliating, and torturing my adulterous wife. You'll never see me more. This has been my way of divorcing myself from a faithless bitch. He was gone before I could find words to reply. But my sense of pain was instantly drowned in a deep desire for vengeance for this outrage, and its impulse so strengthened me that I was soon well enough to travel. My lover, Lord Dunwich, received me with open arms and declared he would shoot or be shot by the Earl ere forty-eight hours had it. Elapsed at once dispatching a friend with his cartel to arrange a meeting for the next morning in Hyde Park, at the dawn of day. We spent the night together at his hotel, although scarcely fourteen days since I was so fearfully outraged, how we fought all night and swam in sensual pleasures for hours. I would deny him nothing. Was he not my champion, who was going to risk his life in the morning to avenge my fearful wrongs and to make him still more earnest in his desire for vengeance? I stripped naked, let him examine every part, where the marks of the bruises and lacerations were still visible. My he sucked, kissed, and fucked till I was beside myself with excitement, and he was also ready for anything. Then my poor bumhole attracted his attention. He kissed and put his tongue into it, till I was eager to have him there, and begged he would put his prick in gently. At first for fear of hurting me too much, this was a heavenly finish to our night of love. We swam in delight. Never before or since have I tasted voluptuous joy to equal that enculae. Next morning, dressed as a young gentleman with a false moustache, I went as one of his seconds to the fatal place of meeting, and had the satisfaction of seeing my wrongs avenged by a ball through the heart of my hated husband. We then went abroad for a while, but my dear lover lost his life by drowning in the Rhine, since which I have consoled myself as you know by all sorts of erotic fancies, especially flagellation, and now, dear Rosa, at the early age of twenty-five, I find myself fast fading away. Finen, times.